Welcome back to the video series on the design of our high-performance home in Atlanta. This is a home that we're building for ourselves. This is what we would do as the home performance experts, the co-hosts of Home Diagnosis. Uh, and I just want to beg you, if you have not seen the other three videos in this series, stop right now and go back and watch those. That is all about the design basics, the enclosure, and the engines. This is about the cherry on top, the whipped cream topping of all of the other layers, which are the most important ones. If you just get this, all you're doing is eating whipped cream. Not good for you. You need to have a basis of all of the other stuff that we are doing in this house. So uh, let's go ahead and dive into it. This is all the bells and whistles that are going into this house. Now, the bells and whistles, just to review, are the home chem controls that we're making sure. Building science is both physics and chemistry. And this is where we're able to talk very specifically about the chemistry that goes into this house. Um, we've got wall surface materials that we need to specify. We need to pick because just going with what your builder installs is the wrong answer. I am convinced. Ozone killing paint, non-reactive sealants. Um, and when I say sealants, what I really mean is finishes. That's uh, apparently the wrong word to use. And so we're going to talk only about finishes at this point because sealants is really about like trying to get water not to do things. And that's apparently the wrong way to go about it. My uh, buddy Peter Colburn, who is at BioShield, has set me straight about that. So if you see the word seal in a wood product, just look the other way. UV microbe control, 24-7 uh, testing and spot testing, depending on what you're looking for, and, and we are going to be looking for quite a lot. Outdoor spaces that we've got going on, and also the solar prep. So, to start with, home chem. The first rule that we're getting to in the bells and whistles portion, right? There's three rules, according to Dr. Richard Corsi, if you watch those home chem videos, which I highly recommend you do on this home performance YouTube channel, is don't bring bad stuff into your house. That is the first rule. The other two rules are keep it dry and ventilate properly, both of which we have dealt with in the last video, which is all about the engines, the HVAC system, the water heating, etc. So in this uh, iteration of the conversation, we're talking about don't bring bad stuff into your house. What does that mean? It means, number one, we want to avoid radicals. Radicals are things within the chemical world that um, like to sleep around. They like to make babies. The ultimate, very simplified version of this is you have chemicals that are originating in your house. You have chemicals that are coming into your house from outside. Those two things are getting together, and they are making babies that are chemicals that were not there to begin with. That should freak you out. It freaks me out. And you don't know what those things are. Home Chem just started to scratch the surface of what those things could possibly be. You want to avoid making babies out of chemicals in your house. That is one of the things that's like, ah, if we don't know what's going on, let's try and prevent that. So ozone, that's O3. Chlorine atoms not chlorine bleach, which I also avoid, to be perfectly clear, but just the chlorine atoms are something you're not going to bring in uh, a bag of chlorine atoms. Hydroxyl radical, which you might not be familiar with. Again, all of these are described in the home chem videos. And NOx, that's nitrogen oxides. That's NO, NO2, and NO3 uh, in increasing orders of uh, badness, NO3 being the real bit bad guy. The six classes are also something that's really going to help you. If you can take the time to watch the half an hour video that we have with Arlene Bloom, that is going to really help to clarify a lot of the stuff that I'm about to blast through on this. So we've got six classes of, of unnecessary chemicals, and I'm going to describe all of those for you in a moment. So magnesium oxide panels are what we're going to build the walls out of. The interior walls will not be drywall because drywall is not very good it turns out. Um, magnesium oxide panels are the exact same size, they're the exact same application and installation, basically, as drywall, um, but they're lighter and they're stronger because they are made out of minerals. So this is about as close as you can get to a single ingredient building material. Uh, what you've got is um, uh, no toxic additives, put around perlite, chloride, and magnesium oxide, MGO. Now, perlite is one of the things that was mentioned by Dr. Richard Corsi when he was talking about these building materials that have an ability to quench indoor chemistry, to help control it. You want that. I want that. I'm using this stuff. Also, um, the this simplified list is great because drywall is actually not, it's like a bunch of stuff because it's made out of organic like they put that certified organic on it. And in this case, organic is not the same as shopping at a high-end food store 
Organic, in this case, means edible. So if you have things in your house that are edible, then that means bugs, mold, fungi, all kinds of different bacteria can eat the things that are food. This is basically rocks. It is minerals. Nothing can eat it because it's just not, it's not made out of cellulose, it's not papery, it has no nutritive value whatsoever. Um, and obviously it's hard, like it's just a powdery, you know, rock. So uh, bug-free, mold-free, fireproof, bam. I can't believe that more people aren't talking about this, frankly. There are people, if you're one of those people right now who's like, ooh, I've heard about this, and I was wondering if somebody's going to do this, I'm happy to be the guinea pig, and I will show you exactly what goes on with this. Um, but I, it's just crazy. There's all kinds of ingredients they put in drywall to make it try to do what this stuff does naturally, being inorganic. And what they're adding to this paper and gypsum and fly ash mix is a bunch of additives, which, if we're talking about physics, only matters if it gets wet, right? If it, there's a flood. But for me, who's worried about chemistry also, and I'm worried about what my children are breathing, I don't want anything that has a bunch of additives that they're not going to reveal to me from the factory. Like, they're not going to give me an ingredient list. I'm absolutely not buying it. Um, I take my kids' breathing air really seriously. Maybe, you know, for some of you, too seriously. I worry about things like vinyl floors in schools, for example. Um, I just think that's wrong. So, BioShield. BioShield is awesome. This is with the clay-based paint that Dr. Richard Corsi, who is my hero as far as all of the stuff in the Bells and Whistles category comes to, uh, mentioned clay-based paints have this wonderful ability. Um, to destroy ozone. They catalytically decompose ozone. What that means is they're not like absorbing ozone and then keeping it. They do not saturate. They literally will keep doing this forever. They take the ozone. The ozone likes to stick to stuff. It sticks to the clay-based paint. Clay-based paint rips it apart, drops it on the ground. Bam, it becomes oxygen, which then goes off and you know bonds with other things and makes m more molecules. Humidity control, also a big deal. The MGO is a moisture, what they call a moisture buffer. You can think of it as like a battery. If it gets too wet in the house, now in this house, the tiny lab where I'm talking to you from right now, which is a 200 square foot, super high performance, you know, tiny house on wheels, there are mostly hard surfaces in here. And the plywood walls behind me, which are beautiful, which are pure bond, are coated. So they're not going to absorb a lot of moisture because they've got a coating on it that um, is not very vapor um, permeable. I believe, I could be incorrect about that, but this stuff is not going to absorb a lot of humidity. So if I have humidity build up in the house at all, which is ho hopefully not likely because we've got a dehumidification system that's dedicated in this house, like we will in the big house, um, then all of it goes into clothes, soft materials like pillows, our bedding, all of that stuff is in my bedroom. So then that becomes a battery to store humidity. In this case, the walls can actually help to control and even out and alleviate any spikes and valleys in your humidity. That's good, as long as you have dehumidification uh, systems in place. <clears throat> and what I'm gonna talk about with the paints here is that the paints will allow that humidity to get through the paint to get into the MGO, the magnesium oxide board. If you put on any typical acrylic paint that you'd find, you know, house paint, it's a lot more plasticky than uh, this stuff is. And so that is not good. Also, this has a crystalline structure. It, I believe that these are aluminum silicates that are inside of this. Um, it's like a porcelain clay, the same kind of clay they would make porcelain out of. And so it has this structure in it. So when it dries, when it cures, all of those structures will bond with each other and they make kind of a uniform structure, which has a texture to it, which is really pretty for a light. So when you're moving past a wall, it supposedly has this like quality of movement to it, which I think sounds beautiful. And I want my family to be happy and to feel like, oh, our house is beautiful, in addition to it being controlled and, and high performance. Uh, and this thing, like the solvents, uh, the solvent in this is water. And the binder in it um, is the same as in white glue, which we all have in school. Very non-reactive, very safe for everyone. In fact, the ingredient list that I just put on the screen is revealed by them on all of their products. They will give you the ingredients. If you want to know how totally screwed up manufacturers are about telling you anything, go watch our video in Dr. Corsi's lab 
that's on the home Chem playlist. It was day number five or day number six on the daily vlog that we did from the home Chem experiment. And it was about Axe spray, which has, see if you look at it, go to the next time you're in the pharmacy or whatever, get a bottle and it has six ingredients listed on it. He did an analysis of this and found that there are a hundred chemical compounds in this thing. They don't have to tell you anything. So they're not going to because they don't care if you know what's in their product. In fact, they'd rather you didn't, right? So that's what I love about this company also is they, they are totally upfront. Here is what we put in our product. And I love that. That is what I'm going to put in my home. So the other aspect of BioShield, uh, which is Peter's specialty, is wood finishes. So this is flooring, cabinetry, stuff like that. Now these are really cool. We've we've selected first of all pecan floors, partly because we had a pecan tree that was at a family's family member's house and it died and it needed to be cut down. So we went ahead and milled it. So we've got tons of this beautiful pecan wood, and some of it is slabs that we're going to use for like shelves, and some is for trim for around the windows and blah blah blah. So we're going to have pecan around, and it looks very beautiful. So we're going to use that as the floor as well. Hardwood, solid, not engineered. It's going to be square cut, and then nailed down. We're going to finish it with the number eight high solid. High solid means it's got a lot of solids in it. That, that stuff that bonds together during the curing process that then leaves this protective coating on everything. Um, the number eight uh, oil is this high solid floor finish. It penetrates. That's one of the cool things about this uh, product. It is not like a polyurethane that you would wipe onto the floor that then dries and forms essentially what is saran wrap on the surface of the floor. That's not what we want. We want something that's going to get into the wood and then bond together to make a scratch resistant, water resistant coating, which is also vapor permeable. Because of course wood wants to flex, it wants to expand when it gets wet, uh, retract when it gets dry. And we don't want to inhibit that on the top, which is what happens when you've got like paint, you know, peeling on places because you've sealed the top and not sealed the bottom. And of course, sealing wood is crazy. You shouldn't do that because wood wants to absorb moisture. It's a moisture buffer when we're talking about moisture, you know, buffers. Wood is the perfect example of that. So all of the wood in the house is going to slightly flex a little bit, right? And we want to allow that to happen. That's part of why we build with membranes is because we, that, Stretching and flexing is is an okay thing when you have prepared for it and you've designed for it. Also, this stuff is plant based, which again, good. They give you all the ingredient list. Spot repairable is something as far as maintenance goes, and I know that Peter at BioShield doesn't want to talk about maintenance, but like this is something that when I'm building a house, I want to make sure that I'm not going to have to spend a lot of time retouching up paint finishes you know, re-waxing stuff. I don't want to do that. That's just not fun. So this stuff, you don't, instead of in, when it gets worn, which it will, because we're going to live here, you're going to use it. And I have kids and they don't respect anything. Um, they will destroy whatever it is. So um, I love my kids. But so when we walk along the same path again and again and again, and it starts to get a little dull and we want it to liven it up, you do not have to strip the whole floor and sand it down and then refinish everything. You can actually just add more to the parts that are looking a little dull. And it works. So that's another beautiful thing about this. Also, zero VOC is something that they... Um, this is a very confusing conversation. And so I'm not going to get too far into it because... Suffice it to say, Home Chem has shown us all that, number one, VOCs are not bad in and of themselves. They are not um, evil created by corporations to save money. They are, like when you smell anything, when you smell what you're cooking, a field of flowers, yourself, you are smelling VOCs. The problem is that when manufacturers use um, these VOCs, they then, if they're photoreactive, meaning light hits it and they it changes, they will create smog, this brown soup that you see outside in big cities. When uh, you say, okay, well, we don't want that because we're going to make some policy that says VOCs are bad. They're not bad for people. That's not why we passed the law. It's not because of like, oh, let's save your children from breathing VOCs. It's actually to do with the smog issue, which also is bad for you. But the non-photoreactive VOCs, are what a manufacturer who doesn't actually care about protecting you from volatility in your chemistry indoors 
would replace it with. They would say, oh, okay, well, we just don't use photoreactive VOCs. We'll just give you non-photoreactive VOCs. BioShield skips that entire conversation, and they just don't use exempts. Exempts are these non-photoreactive things. So they're just not going to give you stuff that's going to be reactive. I think that seeking non-reactive or like non-additive, I guess, that we're still trying to figure out what the language for this indoor chemistry stuff is when it comes to lay people. Because with the scientists have their terms, I don't honestly want to say any of the stuff that they say. It's too confusing. So anyway, all that to say, everything that is coating the floors, the walls, the ceiling is going to not only not contribute negative chemistry to our house, but also is going to then be a, um, it's going to be an absorber, a buffer for that controlling chemistry layer, the home chem layer, right? Now, let's get into the six classes. This woman is Arlene Bloom. She is awesome. She is a mountain climber. That's her main claim to fame. If you've heard of her, you've probably heard of her because she's climbed a bunch of mountains and written a bunch of books about it. Uh, as a woman, that's a pretty cool thing. She also happens to be a biophysical chemist, and she has a, a group called the Green Science Policy Institute, which has developed this thing called the Six Classes. It's an easy way to figure out how to think about chemicals and controlling chemicals in your house. So we're going to go through this right now. We're going to blast through it. Sixclasses.org is where you can really see a lot of this stuff that I'm going to give you thumbnail sketches on. Number one class is the baddest of all of them. It is highly fluorinated chemicals. There are more than 3,000 of, of these things. Probably there are a lot more by now because chemists are doing a lot of work and they're doing a lot of great work. But also, you know, it's Pandora's box, right? So we have this thing that's like an amazing, wow, look at this thing. This is great. Oh no, if I stick it in my eye, that's bad for me. So that's, that's what we're doing is we've got these great things that we're using for like not the right purpose. They are when you have a stain repellent carpet or stain repellent curtains or stain repellent spray that you spray on whatever it is or water repellent, meaning like outdoor gear, rain jackets, you know, Gore-Tex, stuff like that and oil repellents. If you've got any of that, those features going on, probably what is in there is these chemicals, these highly fluoridated chemicals. Um, they are used for carpet, uh, carpets, cleaners. You can see the list here. This is a lot of stuff. I'm not going to read these to you. I'm just going to show you that like these are everywhere, and you need to know what they are. So if you see the word fluoro in a an ingredient list that you're looking at, you don't have to know everything that's in there. But if you see that word fluoro, don't buy it. Is my recommendation. This stuff is linked to cancers, cholesterol, fertility uh, issues, thyroid problems, immune problem development, like all kinds of stuff. And this is not good. These things last forever. They're called forever chemicals because they have no known degradation pathways. There is no way to kill them, essentially. They're invincible. And your body doesn't know what they are, and so it just passes right by them. So we have lots and lots of these in our bodies. Almost everybody does. Kids have a lot of them, too. Um, second class flame retardants, or excuse me, antimicrobials. See, this is, this is a good review for me too. Uh, antimicrobials are also something that like, seems like a great idea, but also not a good idea. First of all, microbes are not bad, just like VOCs, not inherently bad. They are there. We need to realize that they're there. These are put into all of these products. Probably you washed your hands with a soap at some point this week that has an antimicrobial chemical in it. And that chemical stays on your hands because you're not washing it all off. Then you've got this antimicrobial chemical. What is that chemical doing when you then take a French fry and you put it in your mouth and the French fry had a little bit of that antimicrobial chemical on it, right? You get uh, all kinds of this stuff. So first of all, it's going to hurt the good bacteria too. And you want, you are a colony of billions of microbes. That is what you are, the person who's watching this, right? You are a planet of beings. You're not just a human. You're all kinds of different things. So this stuff is going to hurt that too, and it's going to screw up your gut maybe, and you know all kinds of different stuff can happen. It's going to create resistant strains of bacteria and viruses, which is not good. Uh, it's going to mess with your hormones, development, fertility, and allergen, all that, all that stuff, right? So we just try to not buy things that are going to have antimicrobials in them. That's the bottom line is we're just... Everything that is on this list, I do not buy them for my house. And I'm telling you this so that then you can know for a fact that I said I'm not going to. So then when I show you the inside of my house, you better be policing me and being like, hey, you better not buy all that. You know, you said you weren't going to do that. That's what I do with this uh, channel is like tell you what I'm going to do. And then I have to do it because I already told you. Class number three, flame retardants. This is not good. 
um, for a number of reasons. Number one reason is that it goes into a lot of stuff that we're using in buildings. Furniture, kids products, electronics, building materials, wire and cable. Pretty much all of those are going to end up inside this house. That means I'm going to have to not only be smarter and be more educated about what this is and how to avoid it, but also I'm going to have to police and watchdog every single thing that goes in there. I am the builder, so I am allowed to do that because nothing gets bought on this site except by me or by Grace. So this stuff is just not good because, number one, it's dumb. I'm sorry, but uh, the idea that you have to put insulation in your walls that has a flame, some flame return in it to save it for like 12 seconds of flame, when really if there's a fire that's going to make it through the magnesium oxide board or the drywall in your house, it's going to be way more intense than that 12 seconds. Like there's no way that whatever is behind the drywall is going to live. You know, so it's just crazy that we're putting these products in here and the application, again, it's like the application of rules makes no sense. All of these side effects, not good. Number four, bisphenols, that's BPA or BPS or BP, any of those BP whatever molecules and phthalates. And you can just say phthalates. Um, you can ignore the pH. Now, these two are put in plastic. That's what they do is they make plastic work. They make them softer, like more flexible or harder. And so you've got them in all of these things. PVC uh, is something that I'm like, we're going to have to pay attention to. I don't think that I'm going to be able to get by without using PVC in my house. So that's one of those things where I'm like, you know what? There's just not a better option for this. So I'm going to have to do that. Vinyl flooring, I can absolutely avoid. I will never tell anyone they should put vinyl flooring in their house. I will never go to a flooring factory that pushes vinyl flooring. I will, like, that's just something that's easy. Like, oh, vinyl flooring, great. Check, right? I can buy organic. That's my checkbox for the day. Um, shower curtains, plastic toys, right? Caulks, paints, blah, 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 blah. All this stuff. The thing that really pissed me off is cash register receipts. I take a cash register receipt and I fold it and I put it in my pocket and now I've got BPA on my fingers. And then when I take a French fry, I'm eating a lot of French fries in this, uh, this video. But now I've got it in my body. And again, not good for you. All this stuff. Not good. Phthalates, non-reactive. This is an interesting thing, right? So BPA and phthalates, we're not worried too much about, by the way, just as a side note, BPA got taken out of plastic bottles and instead they put in BPS, which also is probably not very good for you either. Um, the alternative is just go with a different material. This is metal, stainless steel. It doesn't have any additives because it already does what it's supposed to do instead of trying to make plastic do something that like it doesn't want to do. So. Um, phthalates are big honking molecules and they hang out and they get in the dust and then they get breathed in by your children while they crawl on the floor and then it has these repercussions. So class number five is some solvents, not all solvents, but some water being a solvent. Water is not bad for you, clearly. So we're looking at mostly oil-based paints and strippers and blah, 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 all this stuff. These things are definitely building materials, right? Nail polish remover, so I'm going to have to look at that when I get my, I have two daughters. So yeah, there's going to be nail polish room over my house. Um, so you need to, again, police this stuff. Really um, try to be as diligent as you possibly can about it, if you care to do that. And I do. So this is how I'm doing it. Has these uh, effects, right? It affects your nervous system and it's been linked to cancer. Number six, last one. <laughs> Don't worry, this is the end. These four metals. Um... So we call these, this class is called certain metals. So lead, arsenic, cadmium, mercury. You have no idea how widespread this stuff is. It's in a lot of stuff. Um, one thing I'd like to point out here is pre-2004 pressure treated wood. How many of you have accepted wood from somebody taking apart their deck and saying, hey, we're just going to throw this away. Do you want it? And you're like, yeah, I'll take that. That's great. I've done it. I'm sure a lot of the men who are watching this right now are like, wait a minute, don't I have that thing that was like, uh, you know, on Bob's house from 1992 and then I took it and I put it, oh no. So there's all kinds of not great stuff in these things and you just need to, again, educate yourself. There are alternatives because there are people like you and me who care about this stuff who are out there manufacturing things and all you have to do is find those people and generally they have a network, right? So you found me, I will hook you up with my network and just keep, stay tuned to the bills and you'll see all that stuff. 
And this, frankly, I'm not even going to list it because it's frankly horribly scary that all of the things that these metals can do for you. Food. That's one thing that really freaks me out, right? It's in like rice. Like arsenic was used as a pest control at one point. So there's all kinds of weird stuff going on with this. But being smarter is better. Green Science Policy Institute is a nonprofit. They are doing, um, they have a donation run going right now. I highly recommend that you go over there if you care about this home chem advocacy and getting more policy so you don't have to pay attention to this and like navigate all this stuff. There, there's just rules that come down from the government that say, you know, the Consumer Product Safety Commission says you're not allowed to use X in children's toys or in building materials. That's what we want because then we don't have to think about it and you don't have to like choose between the one that's e you know evil and the one that's wonderful. Um, so I highly recommend you do that. Go to greensizepolicy.org slash donate. We are going to give 100 bucks tonight. Uh, I just got the email from Arlene. So please go and check that out. And then also Hayward Score is a really easy way for you to just get a thumbnail sketch on how your, your plans or your existing home um, is doing air quality wise and like how it's doing on a scale of what's possible with air quality control and recommendations for how to make it a little better. So you can do that at haywardscore.com. And they, by the way, are one of the uh, founding sponsors of Home Diagnosis Television Show. So just to be a little bit of a Debbie Downer, I'm just going to say sustainability can mean something wonderful. It also can mean something totally dumb. Reduce, reuse, recycle. You will notice that there is nothing reused in the house that I'm talking to you from now, the tiny lab, and there will be nothing reused in that new house. And that is because reusing building materials or reusing baby mattresses or pajamas or kids' furniture or foam, uh, you know, inserts for couches, foam cushions, foam pillows, anything like that, is just really dangerous. The policy, the regulations that Arlene and her colleagues have been able to get through government means that if you were to go on Craigslist and get a used baby mattress, because you think, oh, maybe it's off-gassed all the disgusting chemicals that are in it, the one from 2014 will actually be way more toxic for your child to breathe on and to lay on every night than one that you buy right now that's fresh from the factory. That's pretty sick. So I don't reuse. I think that's a dumb thing to do, frankly, uh, because it's just so dangerous. The chemicals that people put in stuff, you don't know wh who painted what with what material, you know, what the, where it lived, what radioactive dump it went to as, a, you know, to as a parking space for a few years. You just don't want to mess around with that. So I'm just highly recommending to you, think outside the box. Don't do what everybody says and reuse building materials. Don't, don't build a house out of pallets. Okay. Sorry about my rant, but next in line is the, the UV light that's going to go into our duct system on the conditioning airstream. So that if the Mitsubishi system is moving the heating and the cooling around, we're going to have a UV light in there. And it basically controls the microbial population. We are not interested in killing all microbes and viruses because they're, they're here, right? Behind me on this wall, there are literally billions of creatures crawling around, living their lives, and they are also laughing and having intercourse and <laughs> eating and pooping on this wall. And so that stuff is also coming into the air and like, that's okay. It happens. That's what happens in nature. And we all want to go back to nature. That's what's going on out there is there's lots and lots of very, very tiny things that are all over the place. So what we want to do though, is make sure that when my daughter coughs, which she does without, like I'm trying to get this going on with my daughter and, uh, it's been a few months and she's not getting it. So she will sometime, but that the, the virus spread and the microbial spread, the bacteria spread around the house, and especially to do with the coil of the cooling system. When it gets wet, it might get a little bit of, you know, microbial buildup, <coughs> bacteria on it. See that technique? Uh, we want to make sure to control that. You don't want to stop it by doing sanitizing all the time and UVing everything, but just where, you know, in select places, that's a good idea. Also, from CPS, we've got the, the IAQ Smart Air. IAQ, if, in case you don't know, stands for Indoor Air Quality. This Smart Air Station is awesome. It's going into production right now as I speak, and I will have one to show you very soon. Uh, but it's a station that you just set up, you plug in, and it monitors your air quality. 
this thing gets readings that are accurate within three to 20 minutes. I asked the manufacturer, I was like, so um, the inventor's name is Scott. And I was like, this thing gives you reading in three minutes. Are you, are you seriously? Because the other ones that you have on the market, are like you set them up and you let them sit there for seven days before they give you data that you can really trust. That's from their recommendations. This thing, three minutes, and he was like, well, we really recommend that you, you have it run for 20. 20 minutes is like nothing. That's not going to break my back. So 20 minutes to get accurate numbers for PM 2.5. That's particulate matter. That's 2.5 micrometers or microns or smaller. So that's like everything from the tiniest, tiniest little speck up to 2.5 micrometers in size. Um, and that's basically where it's suspended in the air. PM2, PM10 is like pretty, is, is bigger. That's 2.5, 210. And that's going to be big boulder size stuff that comes up in the air and then it's going to slowly fall back down and settle back on the ground. Uh, it's also going to give you carbon dioxide, actual carbon dioxide measurement, not estimated. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it, but that's like an inside thing among people who care about these tools. This is, I believe, one of the first ones that actually will give you the honest to God carbon dioxide built in integrated temperature and humidity. And by the way, all this stuff ends up being a graph that you can chart what's going on and it'll actually, you know, communicate with you. It'll text you or email you when something goes on and you're like, hey, you should pay attention to what's going on in your house right now because something is weird uh, air quality wise. And pressure, which is can be useful. And I, I don't know how accurate the pressure sensor is on this, but you could potentially use this thing for zonal pressure testing without using a manometer. That would be really interesting. Um, and, and what I mean by that is not with a blower door, just with HVAC pressures. Last uh, piece of the puzzle is the outdoor spaces and the solar prep. Outdoor spaces, we're talking about covered spaces. You don't get rained on. Screen spaces because bugs. Oh my God. I can't even tell you. We bought two of these machines that are supposed to like attract mosquitoes and then get them into a little thing and they kill them and everything is, and then you dump it out and like, didn't work. We have mosquitoes, like it's what we produce. It's We're a farm for mosquitoes here and also other stuff, but the mosquitoes are the big one. And then shaded, right? So that you don't have to worry about weather or the sun necessarily to, to be outside and you can be outside year round. So this is called the lanai when we have them in Florida, which is where I'm from. I don't know why other areas of the country don't do this, but it's a great idea. And prepping for solar. First of all, um, I'm not going to put solar on this house as planned because I frankly don't care. I have solar right now on the tiny lab and my panels are plugged in sometimes and other times they're not plugged in. The whole system is a little bit too complicated in my opinion for it to be really um, good feeling for me because there's batteries that run up and run down and the more I use my solar panels, the faster I'll have to buy batteries to replace, to the, and that's 1200 bucks. And then so like, nobody ever talks about that stuff when they talk about how much you're gonna save on your solar. Um, you know, the batteries are something that's really costs money. And then also uh, the inverter, how effective that and efficient that is, and the, all that stuff is just like, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than I think most people give credit for. However, I do want the option to do it in the future. So we're gonna have a standing seam metal roof because they make clips now so that I don't have to drill a hole in my roof to attach these panels. I could just clip it to the standing seam roof. This is a metal roof that has a certain profile. These seams are like three quarter inch high and we can do it that way. That means I, I have to have it pre-wired basically. That's the only thing I need to prep. I need to have a standing seam roof and I need to pre-wire to make sure that I have the access with the wire up there so that I can just do that really easily. And I've got space for the inverter and the batteries down in the crawl space. Now batteries, um, I don't know, I don't keep them inside here and the crawl space in our house to, to come is sure inside. So I don't know whether I would be happy to do that or not. We'll find out later. So please do stay tuned. Uh, that brings to a close the entire conversation about the house. Television show coming soon, January. First TV show about building science and home performance. These are the sponsors. Please take them seriously. Please go visit them. These are the people who care enough about this topic to put it out on national television and make sure that it gets seen by as many people as possible so we can save kids from breathing bad stuff and um, make sure that people are comfortable in their house and not wasting money. If you want to become a mastermind, I have a mastermind course. Go to my website. If you want to watch more videos, you're at the YouTube channel. Watch more videos. We've got over 300. That's what we put them out there for is for you to take them, share them with your friends, embed them on your own websites if you want, whatever. Um, 
And uh, please comment, like, subscribe really helps because that helps us show that we have a bigger audience. Uh, and you can hear my uh, interview show that's called the Building Forms Podcast. So please do comment. As I said, if you have questions about any of this stuff, if you have questions about stuff that I'm referring to in other videos, go watch those other videos. If you have questions about this or if you have comments or things that you're suggesting to me, I love hearing that stuff. In fact, one thing um, is that we had a somebody recommend the uh, tankless, instantaneous, point-of-use water heaters. There was a user on YouTube who picked a fight with me about uh, tankless water heaters. They said, you don't know what you're talking about. And ultimately, we made friends, and it was fine. And they actually said, you know what? This is the way everybody does it all over the world. It's instantaneous, point-of-use. You have a water heater right where you need the hot water created. And I thought, that's actually a pretty good idea. So we are doing that because of Wu Ming who is one of our watchers. And so if you have an idea, please do like say it. I'm just a guy and I literally see all the comments that come through here. Um, so stay tuned, watch the show, watch the videos about the construction. Tomorrow, uh, I have a skid steer, which is a, like a tractor and I've got a hydraulic breaker and I've got a soil compactor and tomorrow I'm gonna get out there and I'm gonna start doing some stuff. You will see that coming up on the YouTube channel. Um, so just hang in there, tune in next time.